which has dominated most of the recent discussions on humanities and engage with new and exciting research across borders and continents. We'll of course engage with traditional humanities disciplines like philosophy or literary studies, but we are equally interested in research that often crosses disciplinary boundaries and conventional ideas of intellectual engagement. At CSDS, we are developing some of these projects on our own, and at the same time, we wish to be in dialogue with scholars from different locations and disciplinary backgrounds, and more crucially, we want to learn from their work. As part of the Critical Humanities series, we have a few upcoming events over the next few weeks. Next Friday, that is February 19th, we have a book discussion on the book Lives of Data, Computational Cultures in India, edited by Sandeep Marthia. Professor Francesca Orsini from SOAS will deliver the BN Ganguly Memorial Lecture on 24th February. The title is Hindi Internationalism, Literature and the Cold War. And on March 5th, Rahul Mukherjee from the University of Pennsylvania will speak on proximate exposures on how human bodies cope with the proximity of radiant infrastructures such as nuclear reactors and cell antennas. Please visit our website and social media pages for more details. Now the title for today's event is Beyond Global Health, with a question mark of course, Diasporic Perspectives on Health and Social Justice. This discussion, as you must have guessed by now, is located in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic that has ravaged our lives in unprecedented ways. We have been forced to rethink, for instance, the relationship between scientific knowledge production, governance, and social justice. We have been made aware of the centrality of various forms of data in our lives, both biological and otherwise, and the technologies and politics that constitute those data sets. We are now even witnessing a bizarre contestation between vaccine nationalism and economic hardship in very different parts of the world. All these and similar other issues have put us in a position that is literally quite unique in history. At the same time, however, this pandemic has also revealed and amplified more enduring questions that have confronted democratic politics for some time. Today, our speakers will reflect on some of the key themes emerging from the multifaceted crisis coalescing around COVID-19 concerning health, scientific knowledge, governance, and justice. From their respective locations and through their respective research experiences, our panelists will discuss issues that will significantly shape our lives in near future. Though the panel is somewhat triggered by the pandemic, our hope is that we'll be able to generate discussions and questions beyond the recent crisis and touch upon some of the broader issues as well. We have four panelists today. One of them, that is Kaushik Sundarajan, Professor Kaushik Sundarajan, will briefly introduce the theme first, and I'll introduce them as and when they speak. They'll speak roughly for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll open the forum for Q&A. Please send in your questions in the chat box, and please mention the name of the speaker your question is addressed to. So I'll first invite Professor Kaushik, Kaushik Sundarajan. Kaushik is Professor of Anthropology and Co-Director, Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory at the University of Chicago. He works on the global political economy of the life sciences and biomedicine with an empirical focus on India, South Africa, and the United States. He's the author of Biocapital, The Constitution of Post-Genomic Life, 2006, Pharmocracy, Value, Politics, and Knowledge in Global Biomedicine, 2017, and Multi-Situated Ethnography as Diasporic Praxis, which is forthcoming later this year. He's currently embarking on a search, sorry, on a research project that studies the intersections between health, law, and constitutionalism in South Africa, provisionally titled Just Health, Law, Constitutionalism, and Political Dis-Ease. So Kaushik, over to you. 
Thank you, Boydik. So thank you so much for the invitation to all of us and thank you to CSDS for, for hosting this conversation. And thanks also to Praveen and Ayodhya for, for all the organizational work in making this possible. Um, I am very happy to be here. I was at CSDS half a lifetime ago briefly in the 1990s and um, it's really nice to be back here with, with, with friends and scholars. Um, Michelle Pentecost, Thomas Cousins, and Sabina Leonelli, all of whom I've taught with and learned from greatly. So um, in June 2020, Thomas, Sabina, Michelle, and I published a conversation in the India Forum titled Situating the Biology of COVID-19. Like so many people at the time, we were trying to make sense of the pandemic as something at once epidemiological, social, and political. We ended up focusing our conversation around questions of disease and democracy, finding that the question of democracy was one that we were all invested in, conceptually and politically. In that piece, we argued that, to quote, struggles for a more just, fair, inclusive, or caring politics in the time of COVID-19 need to be grounded in the everyday work of building institutions, supporting the vulnerable amongst us, and cultivating a deeper ethic of mutuality. Close quote. This conversation, at Boydik's kind invitation, allows us to reconsider our initial conversation along two axes. The first, quite simply, is one of time. We're nine months further on. Some things have changed, some things have remained very much the same. The second is in terms of the nature of the invitation itself. Boydik has invited us to talk a little bit about our own work, none of which specifically is on COVID per se, Though in various ways, all of our thinking now has perhaps been constrained by, conditioned via, and refracted through the conjecture of the pandemic. This means that our conversation today, while touching to various degrees in each of our presentations on the pandemic itself, is also meant to be a brief introduction to each of you about our work and how they insist upon thinking questions of democracy from beyond the paradigmatic prisms of a neoliberalized global health. So we were thinking of each speaking for 10 minutes and then opening things up to a conversation with the audience and also a conversation among ourselves. Sabina will speak first and um, this is what I think we're going to speak about based on a conversation we have had but it might have changed and that's fine but um, Sabina will speak about her work on the politics of data and how that acquires an acute valence in the context of technocratic as opposed to more democratic responses to the pandemic. Thomas will then speak about the geopolitics of vaccine access in Africa and the rise of a certain kind of global health through regional archipelagos that sit in complex and uneasy relationship to histories of national liberation. Michelle will consider relationships of health, science and rights, routing the question through accounts of a trial population she's currently working with. And I will develop the theme of rights by elaborating upon the question of constitutionalism as a global Southern political form one that has particular salience in various domains of the politics of health in South Africa. So with that, I'll um, turn it over to Sabina or to you, Boydik, to introduce her. Thank you, Boydik. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Sabina. Our first speaker today is Professor Sabina Leonelli. Sabina is Professor in Philosophy and History of Science at the University of Exeter where she co-directs the Center for the Study of the Life Sciences and leads the governance strand on the Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. Her research concerns the epistemology and governance of data intensive science, the philosophy and history of experimental orga organisms, and the role of open science in the global research landscape. She is fellow of the Alan Turing Institute, Royal Society of Biology, and Academy Internationally de Philosophie de la Science, Editor-in-Chief of History and Philosophy of the Life Sciences, and she's also Associate Editor of the Harvard Data Science Review. Sabina, go ahead. Thank you very much, Vaidik, and thank you very much indeed for all your help and the help of the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in putting together this event. And of course, many thanks to Kaushik, who has put together this group and with whom is always the most immense pleasure to um, have dialogues with. And of course, uh, Thomas and Michelle. 
And so and it is a great pleasure uh, to be here and participate in this. And as Baitik was saying, my background is in the history and the philosophy of science. And uh, one, um, one of the things I've been uh, worrying about for a long time is uh, questions around data and data practices, and particularly what counts as data in different social situations and under which conditions data actually function or often fail to function as reliable empirical evidence. And of course, that brings us into the space of what do we mean by uh, empirical evidence in the first place. So partly because of this work, um, already at the beginning of the pandemic uh, from February, March 2020, I was dragged into several different collaborations uh, with people around the world that were looking at one topic that then became more and more prominent also in uh, the press all over the world, which is this idea of data readiness, right? Are our data ready to be analyzed and can we use, which data can we use uh, to think about the pandemic and to help the pandemic response and how do we access that data, how do we analyze that data. And so as part of that, uh, I work with several groups in the UK and as part of the Alan Turing uh, national uh, response. In, in Italy with groups of epidemiologists and medical practitioners and I work with international organizations like um, Codata, UNESCO and the FAO, uh, which were looking at how does one actually share this data and what kind of infrastructures we have to do this. And uh, one of the things that really came out very strongly from this is that the very idea of data readiness was a tragic joke in the sense that uh, it was basically there was almost no data that was in any way ready to be shared or to be used uh, for the pandemic response. There was a huge issue with accessing health related data, both because they come from so many different types of social structures and services uh, that varies incredibly, not just between countries, but between different territories and provinces and even little towns. And very often there's very little infrastructure to do this. Uh, there is also a serious lack of uh, governance agreement for what counts as responsible data sharing that would actually respect the rights of the patients involved in this. And um, there is a constant conflict between patient privacy, for instance, and um, actually being able to use data for public health um, purposes. Of course, also many governments, especially in Europe most recently, have severely defunded the kind of social services and data collection services that would have been crucial in this instance. So, for instance, in the region I live in, in the UK, in Devon, uh, the local public health service civil servants, who are the people who are experts in the region and actually can take care of providing and collecting data relevant to public health for this region, you can count on the fingers of one hand. Uh, this is how many people have been left after the various cuts uh, in, um, in, um, uh, by the UK government. And so that also means that there's been very little expertise on the ground that was already ready and primed to contribute to this effort. Uh, so in all of this, uh, this was acknowledged, this was seen, and of course, as usual, there was a very strong tendency to go to technical solutions and, you know, in this case, digital solutions as a shortcut for the humongous social problems that were seen in trying to get hold of this data and communicate them within uh, a national um, territory and also outside of the national territory. And I think this is a context in which we have to contextualize the rise of surveillance technologies as the protagonist of the first few months of the pandemic. Um, this was really seen as a very easy way to remedy this problem of data scarcity. There's so few data, so what can we do? Well, maybe what we do is go to technologies that we assume people have already access to, which are smartphones, and use those smartphones to collect data that may be helpful for, uh, for the pandemic response. And this indeed gave rise to the very strong emphasis on contact tracing and contact tracing apps. So these little apps that you install into your phone and give signals about where you are and may alert you or alert public authorities whenever you come in contact with somebody else who is positive um, to COVID. Now, of course, this adds a myriad problems, which I'm sure you're all aware of, because they've been much discussed um, in, in, in uh, public venues and, and in national media everywhere. Uh, first of all, of course, this is a system that immediately focuses the attention on individual actions rather than community dynamics, 
And this is in a context where, of course, a community dynamics are absolutely crucial to think about transmission of disease. Any expert in public health and epidemiologists would know that, uh, but this is not necessarily the way that big tech companies that were providing the solution actually um, really saw this. Secondly, uh, many of these uh, contact tracing apps, in fact, the vast majority of them, were launched in different ways, in different national contexts, but they were not um, set up so as to complement a parallel effort in, uh, on the side of social services and public health authorities. And so we ended up in a situation where people would get um, um, uh, you know, notifications on their phone saying you've been exposed to a positive person, you need to self-isolate but there would be no follow-up or no correspondence within the medical system, there would be no assistance or support from social services, and in fact this became an almost meaningful uh, exercise by and large. And this certainly was the case in the UK, it was the case in Italy and in many other places where this was implemented. Um, and of course there was um, a very big social, ethical and political backlash against the implications of this kind of surveillance. So one could actually say that um, by and large, and I think most people start to agree on this point, uh, this investment on content tracing apps as an appropriate public health intervention in the case of the pandemic was um, pointless at best and damaging at its worst. And this was the case, for instance, in the Italian app and the UK apps. I mean, these are vastly recognized to have been really useless um, in terms of helping to uh, confront the pandemic. Uh, in France, the situation was slightly different because um, in France, the app was developed in conjunction with public health authorities and it seemed to have a much higher level of effectiveness. And of course, uh, in India, you have uh, one of the most prominent cases of um, an app being launched. Uh, the difference there was that um, Arogya uh, Setu was launched as a contact app on the background of an already ongoing, very extensive effort of digitalizing identities, um, you know, as part of the other um, ID system. And so these are the different dynamics, which will be really, actually really interesting to hear from you and explore uh, in the discussion. And at the same time, I think even in the Indian context, it's quite clear that first of all, this didn't reach um, a vast um, amount of um, members of the population, and it was very disparate, uh, the, uh, whether it reached people that were living in more rural areas than people who were um, urban dwellers, and also um, there is a sense in which um, this really didn't prevent the country from going into a major crisis uh, where hospitals were overflowing uh, over the past summer between June and August 2020. So um, what does thinking about this particular case and these examples can teach us? And I think uh, here, of course, is worth thinking about the broader discourse around the role of the digital and digital technology in transforming society and transforming social relations to political representation and to democratic representation. Uh, of course, many people have already um, discussed the fact that, in fact, reliance on digital technology very often tends to ossify and further enhance existing social structures, including social divides and, um, and power imbalances. And there is a constant concern, and that came out very broadly and very strongly uh, during the pandemic, about how do we pick up digital technologies and everything that's on offer uh, there and make them more disruptive and more responsive to bottom-up concerns and community engagement and the willingness to actually uh, expand the um, democratic power of, um, of voicing um, the needs and the desires of populations around the world. Uh, now, of course, one of the things also to note in that respect is that during the pandemic, we've seen an enormous acceleration of the digitalization efforts all over the globe. Again, very much following uh, already existing fault lines of digital divides. So in uh, richer urban centers, uh, the percentage of people that were relying on digital services and the internet to work went up uh, really incredibly, pretty much all over the world. Um, but of course, uh, this was uh, this automatically then uh, created problems for people that were um, unable to depend on, for instance, reliable um, broadband services. Um, one of the attempts to try and tackle this, which I think is interesting to mention briefly, is this attempt by the World Economic Forum that they called the Great Reset. 
This is the idea of uh, several different countries and very powerful uh, corporate players, including all the big tech uh, from Facebook to Google and Alphabet, coming together in Davos, as they typically do, and recognizing and wanting to make a statement about the fact that um, there is uh, huge amounts of digital uh, divides and power imbalances in the ways in which digital technologies are developing, and something needs to be done about that. Uh, now, I personally also regard the whole discourse of the Great Reset for a high, large variety of reasons that we're not going to get too much into now, but as a very si significant failure. And the failure is partly due to the fact that this was very much set up as a top-down uh, type of activity where already very powerful players that were determining uh, the landscape of uh, the development of digital technologies were now trying to take responsibility, but in just as a top-down way as uh, they've been operating until then. And of course, um, it again brings up big questions around what does it mean for political governance? What does a discourse around reset mean for democratic representation? Uh, you will be aware of the fact that there's been many conspiracy theories that started immediately to float around in relation to this idea of the Great Reset. And I think a legitimate question is to think, well, I mean, aren't these people right to some extent? I mean, isn't this in fact an attempt to take over democratic voicing of actual uh, population needs by a few corporate or powerful agents that are, you know, making up their own idea of what a great reset is supposed to look like. Um, so I think generally this brings us to think about what are the imaginaries of science, data science and science in general, that one can try and construe in a situation like this beyond ideas around surveillance and nationalism. And, you know, and one of the things I've been trying to uh, focus on and many other people in this data space is the idea of trying to, in fact, use data technologies to identify needs in the first place and doing that through significant attempts at community engagement in a variety of different ways. Um, now, of course, this is easier to do in a situation where digital devices are lower rather than already very extensive. And a few examples of that, uh, for instance, are initiatives in the United States where there was already an attempt that was ongoing on long term at engaging different communities around, for instance, the transmission of influenza. And so given the presence already of that engagement, it was very easy to turn that into a mechanism to collect data in a responsible way, in a way that was really bottom up on COVID. And of course, this keeps uh, throwing up problems around what does it mean for different countries to collaborate in this space. I think I'm just going to leave with one final example of this, which I think is interesting because it's been really flaring up this week. Uh, this is a very much touted, um, a celebrated example of successful data sharing, which is the sharing of genomic data around uh, different variants of um, COVID. Um, this has been done mostly through the uh, help of a tool, that a platform that was set up called GZAID. This was an agreement between uh, different providers of um, these kinds of data that whenever they wanted to share the data and wanted to make them accessible, they had to conform to an agreement so that they would all respect um, a certain set of rules about what was okay to do with those data and what was not okay to do with the data. And what that agreement meant was that a lot of people that were working in low to middle income countries that were doing relevant work on this kind felt encouraged to participate in this effort of sharing because they saw that in fact it was acknowledged that there were power imbalances in this effort and having working under this kind of covenant it made it possible for them to trust this exercise of sharing and in fact make all this data available. In the last week in nature and in science a big debate has kicked up where a lot of people that were working in rich laboratories in the global north are now resenting the fact that data sharing has happened under this kind of agreement uh, because they're arguing that this means that the data are not really open, right? Because you can't just, um, you know, rock up to um, the database and pretend to see all the data that are there. You actually have to agree um, to conform to the rules through which this data will be shared. I think it's an interesting episode to just think about um, and of course we'll be developing. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabina. Thanks a lot. Our uh, next speaker is Professor Thomas Cousins. Thomas is Associate Professor in Social Anthropology at the University of Oxford and Tutorial Fellow in Human Sciences at St. Hugh's College. He's an anthropologist of Southern Africa 
with a particular interest in health, labor, and kinship, especially nutrition and pharmaceuticals, and their attendant forms of value and life. He is completing a book manuscript based on long-term fieldwork in the timber plantations of northern KwaZulu Natal. His ongoing research interests include anthropologies of global health, urban animals, metabolism and value, gender, sexuality, and kinship. Thomas, over to you. Great, thanks very much. Thanks, Patrick, and uh, thanks very much to the CSDS for this conversation. And um, I'll just echo Sabina and Kaushik's comments of uh, appreciation for this conversation, which um, the four of us have, uh, uh, have had a few exchanges and I really appreciate the kind of conversations we've been able to have precisely because we, all of us are in a way dislocated from our homes and yet think very much between uh, our various locations and, and have an interest in a kind of cosmopolitanism that um, in a way is very much at stake at the moment. So um, I, I teach anthropology at Oxford, uh, as you just heard, and um, but I thought I would speak um, in, in the first instance about South Africa and situate a perspective from South Africa in relation to partly a regional politics of uh, partly of COVID and, and of scientific knowledge production and of global health. But but I'm interested to think uh, to see how this might connect with conversations in South Asia and uh, and and also in um, in Europe and the US. So uh, Sabina mentioned um, uh, well a number of things that I thought I would just quickly um, run touch base with in relation to the South African context. Uh, and the first being this um, sharing of genomic data. Um, I've been following the work of Professor Tulio Doliveira, who leads the um, KwaZulu, KwaZulu Natal, um, uh, the acronym is CRISP, the KwaZulu Natal Research and Innovating Sequencing Platform. And for many years, he's been trying to uh, encourage these kind of global platforms for sharing data. Uh, initially in, in the context of HIV, which is how I met him through my fieldwork, um, looking at uh, global health interventions around HIV in South Africa. Um, and in fact, Professor Oliveira's lab has been at the forefront uh, since the January 2020 of uh, sequencing the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus and sharing that information with um, other scientists around the world. Um, and it's, it's, it's what's interesting about that uh, infrastructure that exists in KwaZulu-Natal with Durban at its centre um, is that the, that infrastructural and scientific capacity exists because of 25 years of work on HIV. And so the deep expertise around uh, phylogenetic sequencing is what allowed the new variant uh, to be identified. And um, so, so it's these kinds of global networks which are very much at stake. But what I think is important is to situate the particular history of this uh, infrastructure and expertise within a, a social and political history in South and Southern Africa. So um, I, I thought it might be worth just saying a few things about the context of South Africa in relation to um, these uh, social and political histories, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but um, I thought it might be worth mentioning again, partly because there are these interesting articulations with India. As you all know, uh, not only uh, the, the, the historical experience of British colonialism uh, and of, of course Gandhi moving back and forth between South Africa and India, but then more proximately uh, through to um, more recent um, connections through, uh, through BRICS, obviously the kind of geopolitical connections, but, but uh, in the context of this debate, um, I thought it'd be worth mentioning the, the connection through HIV and the, the struggle in South Africa to, to gain access to, treat, to treatment for HIV, which the, uh, the Indian pharmaceutical manufacturing capacity was key in that struggle. So there are interesting uh, solidarities and histories here that link us uh, in relation to struggles against colonialism and uh, debates about the form that democracy should take which uh, not least of which is this uh, history of, of uh, population registration, which uh, Sabina mentioned a moment ago. Um, some of you might be familiar with the work of Keith Breckenridge at the Witts Institute for Social and Economic Research, 
who's written extensively on the, the, the history of uh, the population registration technologies. And in South Africa, uh, which is one key site of that, of that uh, the development of that technology, we know that the, 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 the interest of the state to develop a, a population registry was very much founded on a, uh, a technological fantasy of being able to uh, categorize every individual by race. And, and, and we know how that worked out. But the post-apartheid South African government inherited that technology and has tried to improve on it and, and digitize it. Um, and in some ways it, it's proved very successful, but in other ways uh, it's, it's produced new forms of exclusion. And uh, there's a very tragic uh, uh, sort of incidents the last couple of weeks actually, where many, many grant recipients uh, have been told they need to re-register if there's some glitch in the system. And so um, it's forced people to queue for hours and uh, the police turned water cannons on them. Absolutely gross, uh, disgusting treatment by the state uh, in the service of um, you know, the, the uh, re population registry database for the administration of social grants. So these are, these are deep questions which, which aren't going to go away. Um, and as Sabina has mentioned, there are profound uh, debates and questions uh, around uh, how data are generated and how they're regulated and managed, which, which um, are not only questions for the global north, but have profound implications for uh, ordinary life and welfare in places like South Africa and, uh, and I understand in India as well. So, um, to the extent that, that you probably all know something about the post-apartheid history of South Africa, uh, in the last 25 years, uh, the, the democratic order has uh, has really struggled with trying to uh, redress the, uh, the, the the terrible wounds inflicted on the majority of South Africans under the racialized system of apartheid. But um, there are several key moments in that history which which really condition the situation we find ourselves in now. And the first of those is the shift uh, in 1996 away from uh, uh, the reconstruction and development program which is much more broad-based uh, imaginary of social services towards uh, a much more um, narrow focus on macroeconomic stability under the uh, growth employment and redistribution program so that uh, really kind of inter internalized the sort of world bank style ideas about economic stability which in, in many ways now many south africans understand to be the root of, 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 the, of the kind of post-apartheid failures to redress uh, the terrible divides of poverty and, equality and inequality. But that's not the only key moment. Uh, as you all know, the, the terrible devastations of HIV that exploded in the 90s and 2000s um, led to some very acute uh, uh, social and political questions, not least of which is the, the, pre the former president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, denying that HIV caused AIDS and refusing to provide antiretroviral treatment uh, through the state public healthcare system. And so uh, the work of Treatment Action Campaign and other organizations to force the, uh, the South African government to provide treatment through the public healthcare system was a major success uh, that had, um, it, it required um, legal, but also uh, kind of social mobilization and the treatment literacy um, set of efforts. So huge, it was a huge success for, um, for ordinary citizens and, and for civil society. And uh, that whole period during the 2000s, uh, while many, many people lost their lives, but it, it, did, it also produced um, a scientific research capacity and, uh, and, it, and it re reinforced um, a tradition of social activism, drawing on the anti-apartheid uh, tradition. Uh, and, and bringing it into a, a post-apartheid period, um, the idea that there might be a, a social set of um, obligations that we owe each other. Um, but then the, the other key uh, historical fact to appreciate is um, from 2008, the presidency of Jacob Zuma. And what followed was 10 years of uh, increasing crisis in uh, the state's capacity to govern. Um, you might have heard about the involvement of an Indian family, the Gupta brothers, uh, who were very much involved in former President Zuma's uh, um, efforts to undermine the state. And, and uh, basically the, the, uh, um, what's been called state capture is a, is a massive effort to undermine state capacity and, and, um, and uh, redirect public funds towards private gain. 
Uh, and that all uh, came to a head about three years ago. Um, and so, so we're living in the aftermath of 10 years of, um, of collapse of state uh, services, service provision and tax collection and uh, um, questions about the, the, the legal and, and constitutional order. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, Kashik will address some of that in a moment. But uh, so, so all of this is, is by way of context to, to say that um, by the time that we get to the, 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 the COVID crisis, uh, the South African society is, 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 uh, is, 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 is challenged on a number of fronts. On the one hand, um, the post-apartheid state has been um, a success story in being able to deliver social services and expand uh, cash payments. At the same time, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, there's been 10 years of very severe corruption. And so the effort now is, 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 there's, a, there's a serious challenge of, uh, of how best to, to constitute a, a meaningful response. The, the ANC as the, as the governing party is internally riven uh, into two, at least two factions, uh, which means that it's, it's unable to make decisions very quickly and easily. Um, on the one hand, the, the Cyril Ramaphosa, current president Cyril Ramaphosa has been well informed by the scientists and the science has directed state policy uh, in, in relation to um, the response to COVID in some respects. It was a very hard and quick lockdown in March last year, but it wasn't backed up by contact tracing or any social mobilization. And so while there, there were quite low infections and, uh, and death rates in the first lockdown, what we've seen now uh, um, over the second wave, which is really peaking right now, it's just peaked, um, is, is a huge explosion of infections and, uh, and mortality. So uh, civil society activists in South Africa are feeling quite um, um, agree well, they're struggling at the moment with uh, how best to engage a whole range of crises. On the one hand, we have very, very good uh, scientific expertise and scientific knowledge production, and it seems that that is, is informing uh, state policy very well in some respects. Uh, but on the other hand, there are other aspects of the states that are, that are, that are still uh, very corrupt and uh, um, very undermined in terms of capacity to respond. So um, as of the last couple of days, you might have seen um, the big discussions about the, the vaccine strategy now that the results have come out on the limited efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is data produced by, partly by Professor Tulio de Oliveira and his, and his, uh, his laboratory at uh, the University of Quasi Natal. So uh, there's an interesting question now about uh, what the best strategy would be going forward in terms of the combination of vaccines um, and whether there should be a, an effort to limit mortality and severe infection hospitalization in the first instance. Um, and how that might sit alongside uh, uh, um, more mild infections, which might produce uh, other long-term effects. And uh, so, so the other key dimension that I, I'll just I'll finish off with is um, South Africa's relationship to uh, countries around Africa. So on the one hand, uh, President Ramaphosa has spearheaded quite a, uh, an admirable effort to uh, to uh, secure vac access to the vaccine to various vaccines for many African countries through the African Union. At the same time, the geopolitics of Africa and post and post uh, colonial countries means that uh, country uh, presidents and, and ruling parties are very reluctant to criticise each other. So we know that there is a, a severe crisis, for example, in Zimbabwe of of governance, um, uh, and and COVID is very severe there. But, uh, but it's less clear um, how, that's going to tr how that'll unfold in terms of the, the kind of regional uh, solidarities that might emerge around that. Uh, so, so, you know, South Africa stands out as, as one kind of example where there has been a strong state historically in some respects, very problematic in terms of uh, the history of apartheid. Um, and very patchy in its post-apartheid abilities to extend uh, care and welfare and services to, to all South African citizens. 
but it sits at a strange angle to uh, the history of global health in the last 20, 25 years, where uh, in, in many African countries with weak governments, uh, global health assemblages of one kind or another of uh, you know, combinations of philanthropies, research organizations and, and other kinds of um, international bodies have been the source of access to healthcare and treatment uh, over the last 25 years. So it's a very patchy picture in the rest of Africa um, and increasingly so even within South Africa right now. Uh, so there, in many ways, the, 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 some of the conversation we've been having is to ask what if we can think about uh, another kind of um, uh, governance imaginary that we might uh, be able to foster in, uh, in this current crisis and going forward, precisely because uh, many of the, the organizations and architectures of global health of the last 25 years have produced uh, forms of social exclusion uh, uh, even as there's been a focus on certain uh, on, on, on three or four particular diseases. So what comes after global health in a way hinges partly on how we can imagine uh, new forms of, of uh, political recognition and, and solidarity, but it also hinges on whether we can engage with uh, a set of new challenges around ecologies and environments. So it, 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 I think we're all starting to get a, a better sense of the connections between uh, ecological change and um, zoonosis and public health uh, arrangements. But in a sense, we haven't yet seen um, what kinds of progressive social and political formations might adequately respond to these new kinds of uh, contexts we find ourselves in. So the, last, the very last um, uh, point I wanted to land on to pick up on a, on a concept that uh, the anthropologist James Ferguson has been developing recently in relation to debates about the universal basic income, which I think is relevant for thinking about uh, forms of solidarity uh, all over the world, not only in South Africa and not only in the context of basic income. And that's what he's calling the notion of co presence. Uh, the idea that uh, we might be, uh, we think of citizenship as co-membership of a certain kind of club of, of a nation state uh, is fast becoming inadequate for, for thinking about redistribution and forms of uh, recognition. And so he's suggesting that we think about co-membership and co-presence together, where co-presence is not a physical, literal uh, uh, immediacy, but as some other kind of more complex set of arrangements and agreements where we uh, come to recognize our forms of mutual interdependence. So uh, on that, I think I'll, I'll hand over to uh, the others to continue with, uh, and we can uh, love to develop this conversation with, with all of you shortly. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks a lot. Our next uh, speaker is Professor Michel Pentecost. Michelle has a dual training in clinical medicine and medical anthropology. She is a lecturer in global health and social medicine and a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow at King's College, London, and an honorary researcher at the University of Witwatersrand. Her current research in South Africa investigates the social and ethical implications of public health interventions in the early life period from preconception to early childhood and develops innovative qualitative methodologies for studying the social factors that shape life trajectories. Michelle, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Bardek, and um, thank you all for inviting me to this conversation. As others have said, uh, it's a small silver lining of the pandemic that we've now grown accustomed to having these conversations across time zones. And certainly I hope that this is one collective response to the present crisis that endures beyond the pandemic. Um, and thanks again, as, as everyone has said, to, to Bidek and, and colleagues for putting this together and to my, my interlocutors. So uh, as Bidek has mentioned, I trained as a physician before postgraduate studies in anthropology. Uh, and my work has largely been concerned with global health policy regarding reproductive and children's health. And this lens has been very productive because smuggled into our frameworks of maternal and child health are assumptions about potential 
and uh, about the future. And uh, I quote um, feminist STS scholar Michelle Murphy, who has argued that reproduction might be better thought of as a politics of redistributing relations, possibilities, and futures. And this has been particularly compelling to think with in the context of South Africa, where the forms of futurity that characterize the global health era have in many ways resonated with the liberal democratic project uh, and its disappointments. And uh, very grateful to Thomas for having given you quite a lot of context about South Africa, so I don't have to have to repeat that. Now, I don't think I need to belabor the point in this audience that for all of our focus on the social determinants of health in the last few decades, inequities in health outcomes persist. Um, Alondra Nelson, who is the new Deputy Director for Science and Society in the Biden administration, uh, really puts it very succinctly that the pandemic has confirmed what we know but have failed to address about social inequality. And South Africa is perhaps the most unequal country in the world. The middle class has managed the pandemic in relative comfort, but for the majority of South Africans, the pandemic experience has included 130,000 excess deaths, which is one, one of the highest numbers in the world, the loss of 3 million jobs, a really rapid increase in levels of hunger, uh, a really massive increase in tuberculosis infections, uh, as well as gender-based violence. Uh, and to paraphrase uh, Michelle Murphy again, these effects are the product of infrastructures and relations that configure what forms of life are nurtured and what forms of life are constrained, which in the South African context, as Thomas has discussed, relate to a history of colonialism and apartheid and persistent racialized inequalities in the present day. Now, in terms of my own work, I've contributed to a scholarship that has sought to unpack the implications of what we broadly refer to as post-genomic science for national and global policy, a project that, of course, uh, Kaushik and Sabina have also contributed to in very important ways. Um, so the epigenetic and life course sciences have offered us a much more nuanced understanding of the interplay between our genetic inheritance and our social or environmental milieus. And yet what we've noticed at social, as social scientists um, is the persistent forms of boundary work that have happened to delineate the quote unquote environment as a category for intervention. And in place of intervention at structural levels, the environment has very much been reframed uh, to land in the maternal body, the infant body, uh, reinvigorating long histories of these entities as the target for public health intervention. And of course, maternal and child health is an important area of concern and we should devote a lot of resources and attention to, to that. But a core concern um, of the social science work here has been the intensification of a highly gendered and racialized approach, which has landed individual responsibility for health outcomes um, in the body of, of the mother, for example, and not just in the responsibility for personal health, but for the health of future generations. And so what, what was intended to be a life course framework that could attend to the social determinants of health, thinking intergenerationally, has been somewhat undermined. Now, the response to this within feminist SDS scholarship and the sociology of epigenetics has been the beginnings of a shift in thinking about the utility of an individual rights-based framework for health. And I really thought it would be useful to introduce this in this forum because the opportunities or pitfalls that might attend a move to solidarity-based rights frameworks seem to be something that is animating both conversations about the COVID response, solidarity is a term that we, we seem to be referencing a lot, um, and then interestingly a solidarity-based rights framework is also something that is animating conversations about intergenerational justice in contexts where there is activism around the, the impacts of legacies of colonialism, slavery, and environmental degradation on the health of future generations. Now, interestingly, many of these conversations are based on an appeal to a relational ethics. Um, and this echoes somewhat what Thomas was saying in relation to Ferguson's work. 
And this relational ethic sees relations as constitutive of autonomy, that we only have our relational selves, that we only exist by virtue of our relations, that we cannot abstract beings from their social and ecological relations. And this is a conversation unfolding both in the field of bioethics and is also very much the thrust of feminist scholarship that seeks to expand the notion of reproductive justice to include all of those practices that sustain or destroy future worlds. So certainly from different angles, we are seeing a move towards solidarity-based rights frameworks, which may well be a more appropriate tool for achieving health for all, but of course comes with its own difficulties and side effects, some of which Sabina has, has spoken to. But solidarity here would then seem to need to take on a, a plural form. Uh, we have intergenerational solidarity, thinking about how it might be that future generations can have rights that, that we, we can in fact attend to. Um, Thomas has already alluded to multi-species or planetary solidarity, attending to our more than human relations. And then a, a third one that I've come across recently that I find very useful is thick solidarity what uh, Roseanne Lure and Savannah Shange have defined as mobilizing empathy that is historically and politically informed and invites critical dialogue and foregrounds those who have the most at stake, thinking beyond an older version of, of liberal empathy, perhaps. And the question that I'm devoting a lot of time to at present is if justice and solidarity are the foremost values that should perhaps orientate the paradigm of whatever comes after global health, then how best is that um, operationalized? And uh, this question is very important as I embark on this new research project, which is a partnership with a multi-country trial. It's called the Healthy Early Life Trajectories Initiative. It's a WHO-led um, behavior intervention study uh, that looks at whether interventions around nutrition, exercise, and other lifestyle factors in women of reproductive age or preconception um, may have impacts on future um, rates of childhood obesity and non-communicable disease risk. This multi-country trial is happening in Canada, China, India, and South Africa. Again, another really important linkage between India and South Africa are the, the, the groups of scientists who work in this area. Um, and um, I will be working with the cohort that is rolling out in Johannesburg. And what I'm going to, to try and do here, thinking with this, this framework of justice and solidarity, is to use methods from anthropology and bioethics to attend to the institutions, networks, ideas, and practices that shape what it might mean to intervene preconception or before the beginning. And whether we can use this approach in ways that might promote rather than undermine equity. So here we'll be working with everyone involved in running this trial from the WHO to the community healthcare workers on the ground. And this work will be about continually foregrounding, documenting and analyzing the forms of structural and discursive power that either prevent or promote a commitment to principles of equity and justice in knowledge production. We'll also be doing a five year qualitative longitudinal study with 60 of the participants in the, in the, the trial, which was recruiting 8,000 women in Johannesburg. And here we'll be using participatory methodologies that center the participants as key stakeholders to ensure that the recommendations of the trial are maximally responsive to local context. So here's trying to, to work with a very broad remit that um, expands the lens of the trial to understand participants in their social contexts with their close relations and their life circumstances. Now it will be very interesting to see what the, the trial has to offer in terms of its epidemiological findings, but I'm personally more interested in whether it may be possible uh, in, within this research infrastructure to shift the frame of the intervention to reflect a broader set of social concerns that do not center on women of reproductive age in isolation as the target for individual interventions. In other words, to engage in an experiment around knowledge production that tries to build an evidence base that does center and foreground uh, justice and equity. So um, I do hope that I'll be coming back to um, the center soon uh, in future years to share my findings with you, but um, I really look forward to the conversation today. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks a lot. Our final speaker uh, today is 
Professor Kaushik Sundararaj and I have already introduced Kaushik. So I'll just invite him to present. Kaushik. Thanks, Arthik, and thank you all for these preceding presentations. Um, they just they just enrich me um, in my thinking so much. So I myself and 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 some of what I'm going to say is going to carry on from from things that that Michelle and Thomas have left hanging about South Africa. But I myself plan not to talk about COVID at all, and instead to tell you very briefly about some new research that I'm undertaking on health law and constitutionalism in South Africa. There's a post-apartheid South African history of claims to health being made through the law. What interests me is how significantly these claims are constitutionally mediated, not least because South Africa has a constitutionally mandated fundamental right to health. What I wish to signpost is a politics of health that is also a politics of constitutionalism. By this, I mean not just the doctrinal application of the formal tenets of a text to situations of health and disease, but an interpretive and democratic terrain of advocacy, adjudication, and contestation. I can't go into any deep empirical detail about this today, but I do want to give you a flavor of the terrain of politics that I'm concerned with here. One sees a whole arc of post-apartheid constitutional jurisprudence around health in South Africa. As I said, I won't go into the details of these cases because of time, but to give you a sense of the range of seminal cases, they include, for instance, Minister of Health versus Treatment Action Campaign, a seminal 2002 constitutional court verdict that obligated the Thabo Mbeki government, and this is speaking to some of what Thomas was saying, obligated the government to make the antiretroviral niverapine, which prevents mother-to-child transmission of HIV, accessible through the public health system. And this is a landmark verdict in the midst of a pandemic in the context of Mbeki's AIDS denialism. Then there were two landmark cases concerning tuberculosis, Dudley Lee versus Department of Correctional Services, which won damages for the plaintiff, Dudley Lee, after he had contracted TB while imprisoned in Polesmore Prison, and Mankai versus Anglo Gold Ashanti Limited, which won damages for a minor, Tembikele Mankai, who contracted TB while working in the mines. And then a recent class action that was settled, Nkala versus Harmony Gold Mining Limited and others, settled in 2019 between 40 major national and multinational mining companies and miners and their widows who had contracted TB or silicosis since 1965. Thus one sees a whole range of cases, ranging from those that hold the government responsible for ensuring access to essential medication, to those that sue for delictual damages against both state and corporate entities, which are typically in Anglo-American jurisprudence heard under the domain of tort law, being heard and adjudicated as constitutional matters. This has to do not just with so-called biosocial concerns, but also articulates in significant ways to labor politics and to histories of white monopoly capitalism. Things like mining, corporate accountability, transitional justice, very important here. Thus, the interesting point at issue here is not just that health is coming to be judicialized, but that this judicialization is so deeply inflected by an ethos and politics of constitutionalism. Thus, I wish to set up as an empirical and comparative provocation, constitutionalism as a certain kind of counterpoint to the technocratic, as a mechanism through which a politics of health might emerge. Not an unproblematic or uncontested counterpoint by any means. I'm not saying turn health over to the jurists and we'll have democratic, equitable or accessible health care. But one that opens up certain possibilities for thinking the relation between science and democracy that are actually in the contemporary American context quite impossible to think. In my own work, I'm embarking upon an ethnographic reading of these cases as an entry point into thinking the terrain of a constitutionalized politics of health in South Africa. By an ethnographic reading, I mean a situated reading. What does one need to know in order to understand each case, historically and politically, in a conjuncture of transition from apartheid to post-apartheid democracy? How are these cases emblematic of a certain discourse, certain public discourse around constitutionalism? 
what are the implications of, to use Jean and John Komarov's provocative formulation, class struggle becoming class action? And finally, how does this help us understand the politics around certain kinds of diseases? I don't have the time to elaborate any of these questions in great detail. As far as the legal side of this equation is concerned, I just wish to mention two things. First, constitutionalism is an obligatory point of passage through which the politics of health plays out in South Africa. This does not mean that an embrace of the constitution as the organizing principle of a transformative politics is uncontested. On the contrary, there are long histories of contestation going back to the days of the anti-apartheid struggle over whether a rights-based constitutional framework for a post-apartheid democracy premised on social justice and transformation was the right one to adopt. These politics are particularly fraught today in relation to questions of land and land expropriation. Nonetheless, constitutionalism as a terrain of struggle is foundational to an understanding of contemporary South African politics, most certainly in the arena of health. And it's important here also to distinguish, as the South African constitutionalist Al B. Sachs does, between a constitution as a formal, authoritative, often sacralized originary text, and constitutionalism as a normative ethos that organizes political imaginaries. One can be a constitutionalist without deifying a constitution. Second, constitutionalism is not just about formal legal adjudication. It is quite significantly about advocacy, about the democratic processes of interaction between civil society and courts. This fact, of course, is evident to anyone who is engaged in legal advocacy in the Indian context as well. But it's sometimes easy to forget in the currently more positivist and originalist echelons of American constitutional politics. Hence, not just positivist legal theory, but American critical legal theory often tends to be blind and typically parochial to the ways in which constitutional politics might be a far more malleable and open space for democratic contestation than is currently imagined or imaginable in American contexts. Thus, constitutionalism is not just about the application of the law to health, but rather is about, as prominent South African lawyer and health advocate Mark Haywood has put it, making, shaping, and breaking the law. Let me end by thinking about the politics of disease in South Africa, not COVID. While I followed some of the public debates around COVID response in South Africa, I've done so from afar, and I'm not in a position to speak in any granular fashion about these politics. Rather, I wish to mention a couple of things about tuberculosis, which like HIV is another prefiguration, and in this case, another respiratory disease that in some ways prefigures the politics of COVID. Uh, TB is a quintessentially colonial disease brought to South Africa by Europeans in the 19th century, including especially those seeking the cure from the European TB plagues by establishing sanatoriums on the frontiers of the Eastern Cape. And it bears remembering in the midst of fears of the so-called South African variant of SARS-CoV-2 that COVID-19 was also brought to Southern Africa from Europe. One hears a lot from Euro-American social theory about the so-called ruptures brought about by COVID-19, but as Gayatri Spivak reminds us, what is thought of by the Metropolitan Center as rupture is quite often repetition. Those who have been colonized know this only too well. TB is a quintessentially colonial disease in its imbrication with histories of mining, central to the establishment of an imperial economy and dependent upon migrant labor from around Southern Africa. A central part of my current research is a collaborative project with the writer Stacey Hardy and composer Neo Muyanga, Pulmonographies, which is an exploration of the colonial histories and post-colonial presence of TB in South Africa. An important, part, an important part of this story, as I've already mentioned, is judicial and constitutional, especially via the verdicts in Mankai and in Kala. I want to suggest here how seminal Mankai was on one count, and remember this is the case of a miner who sued a mining company because he had contracted TB in the mines and received damages. Um, on the grounds of right to, you know, constitutional rights. And the thing here is that this was a case of an individual getting damages from a corporation on constitutional grounds. One of the fundamental purifications of Western law is the separation between public and private domains of the law 
such that public domains of the law, such as constitutional law, tend to apply solely to the state. Questions of corporate accountability get left to private domains of the law, such as contract, commercial, or tort law. In breaking that binary, Mankai provides, as South African legal scholar Tladi Marumo suggests, potential strategic mechanisms for holding corporations accountable in ways that could have resonance well beyond the South African context. And one thinks, of course, of the tragic failures of justice, for instance, for Bhopal gas victims here. Let us remember that the struggle for a democratic healthcare is not just about holding the state accountable, but about holding corporations accountable too for their acts of both omission and commission. So I'll stop here. The point I'm trying to make is not a celebratory one of constitutionalism as a means to democratic health. I am, however, suggesting it as a salutary counterpoint to more technocratic kinds of public health intervention. Nor do I wish to uncritically romanticize South African constitutional interventions into health, even though there is much to admire and learn from the South African experience. Rather, I want to suggest that forging comparisons might allow us to think in more imaginative ways of terrains of democratic health than the top-down models of Euro-American global health tend to imagine, not least if we're attuned to the fact that constitutionalism itself emerges out of very different origin stories and inhabits different terrains of struggle in different contexts. Thus, the constitutionalist response to COVID-19 in America were armed protests by right-wing militia at state capitals around the country protesting lockdowns and masking because freedom. One of the earliest constitutionalist responses to the pandemic in South Africa, by contrast, was the expansion of social childcare grants to women. There is much to think about in that contrast, not least from India, in the context of an increasingly authoritarian environment that manifests in domains of health as well, especially as we think across the arc from the CAA protests to the farmers' protests. Thank you, Kosi. Thanks a lot to all of you. Uh, I'm sure we'll have various questions. We are already seeing questions. Please send your questions through the Q&A segment. I'll read out the questions. I think we'll start with the first question, with Prathama's question. You know, this is one idea which has come back again and again during uh, many of your presentations, particularly in Sabina's presentation, in Thomas, in Michelle, and to a certain extent in Kaushik's presentation as well, which is this uh, status of the data. You know, what uh, happens to this data uh, set that we are looking at right now, not only in the uh, context of COVID, but if we can think of something like a post-pandemic world as well. So I'll just briefly read out uh, Prathama's uh, question. She's asking, how does one theorize the conceptual and political difference between biometric and genomic data in context of the democracy question? In terms of both governmental mobilization of data as well as representational issues. I think this is a question to many of you. So whoever wants to respond or go first. Shall we follow the same order? Uh, start with Sabina and then see. I can, I can start. This is of yeah. course a very long discussion. Thank you very much for, um, for a very provocative question. Um, so I think maybe the first thing to uh, think about is the fact that when one thinks about genomic data, certainly, especially in the context of the pandemic, there are big differences um, in terms of what, what we're doing with non-human data here and what we're doing with human genomic data. Uh, and I think that's, that's a very basic divide uh, to make, not because in non-human data we don't have very, very serious questions around representation and inequity of the structures of governance around uh, those data, but because these are, in a sense, different. And, and they happen at different levels. Um, so I think when it comes to the human case, uh, when one thinks about biometric and genomic data, I mean, the most blatant difference immediately is the type and amount maybe of mediations, um, structural, technical, um, uh, you know, in terms of expertise and, and um, you know, complexity uh, that are required to produce this data and to disseminate them. Right. So uh, I think for most of us, uh, I think even in um, very rich parts of the world, uh, there's no real yet immediate access to genomic data about yourself. 
while biometric data are produced all the time in any possible manner, really. I mean, like at least for, for many of us, uh, you know, I mean, I have, for instance, a smartwatch. <laughs> so in my case, I literally have biometric data being produced about me every second of the day in a, in a very wide variety of ways. And um, that makes that situation very different in terms of uh, representation and governance than the case of genomic data, which are typically already funneled through a certain part of the medical system, whether that's private or public. This said, of course, uh, there's also very important similarities. And that's the fact that while one can think that all these efforts around the quantified self and so on and so forth, uh, actually give a certain amount of agency to people who are, you know, so-called data subjects, uh, to put it in European law terms, so people whose data are actually being uh, picked up and, and used in a variety of ways. Uh, but we're still in a situation where that use is incredibly opaque. And even again, within a European context, which is important because in Europe, we have now the only legislation in the world where um, a, whoever picks up biometric data um, is at least in theory responsible for making the original uh, data subject um, aware of how those data are being reused. Um, even in the European context, this is happening in ways which are totally non-transparent, uh, basically impossible to follow. And in fact, transparency is really not an answer there either, because uh, these are very, very complex ways of um, them processing data, integrating them with other types of data. I mean, and really like giving a lecture to people every time about what exactly is going to happen to their data is kind of a completely pointless way <laughs> of trying to address the situation. And um, so, you know, it's, it's a... There can be a very long-winded answer to this question, but I think, um, you know, at the very least, there is a sense in which um, the ways, I mean, one has to really pay attention to the ways in which these different kinds of data are mediated, which institutions are responsible for that, and whether anybody is at all accountable for it. And that comes even before starting to get into questions of representation, because unless we understand those issues, then we actually don't even know who is being represented how and for what, uh, which seems to be the key question here. Would anyone else like to take a stab or should we just take a couple of more questions and then probably come back? I have two more questions on this data uh, issue as well. So once uh, we take these two and before we go to uh, the constitutionalism question, uh, let's deal with these two uh, data question and then we can come back once again to other issues. This is uh, from uh, another colleague of mine, Ravi Sundaram. He's asking, uh, this is for Sabina, but this is I think also a question many of you have hinted at, so it would be interesting to know your views as well. He, Ravi is asking that in the 19th century, cholera epidemics helped make uh, you know, arguments for large-scale urban planning and new technical infrastructures. The cholera crisis normalized certain forms of violent reorganization. So looking forward, do you think can large scale data infrastructures get a new lease of life after COVID? And this, of course, in the context of what we already know about Snowden revelations and the Cambridge Analytica scandals. So what would be the future of this, this kind of, are we seeing a 19th century kind of development or is there something more or something much more different? How do you see that? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, if I just jump in very quickly, then it'd be great if um, others also said what, what they think about this one. Uh, so thank you, Ravi. This for me is a key question because that's pretty much what I spend most of my time uh, working on. So my hopeful reply and what I spend a lot of my time working on is, yes, we are looking at a situation where infrastructures can get better um, because I do think that these play a very crucial role in any form of transnational politics slash science at this point in time. In fact, if we even want to conceptualize any transnationalism here, I think it passes through uh, these kinds of infrastructure. So I want to be hopeful, but I'm really not, um, I've got to say. So I think, first of all, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about the beginning of epidemiology as a science and locate, um, you know, and of course, uh, cholera epidemics are, are very much part of that, uh, even just in terms of starting to produce data in a systematic way and the rise of statistics at the same time. So it's a very interesting point in time to point to. But in fact, the whole of the 20th century has been a march towards what some people call global informationalism. Like the, the rise already from the beginning of the 20th century of large, supposedly global data infrastructures in meteorology and in um, 
in, uh, in for instance, crops, um, you know, many of them geared towards facilitating trade, of course. And so we've seen a real incremental, um, incredible purification um, of these um, infrastructures. I mean, what we're looking at now, I guess one of the things that the COVID pandemic certainly has, um, you know, Un, you know, uncovered even more and, and maybe more widely uh, than for people who are working in that field is the incredible, incredibly dysfunctional um, lack of relations. Uh, you know, if one thinks about relational ethics, that, that really says something, um, as Michelle was saying, um, between these various different infrastructures. So we are seeing that almost a manifestation of several kinds of political wills, uh, all of which have some sort of power, because otherwise you wouldn't have the infrastructure. This require uh, really a um, you know, very strong amount of resources and, and, and so forth to actually be put together, but also incorporate very particular visions um, for what data count for whom and what is valuable and, and what should be pursued in the future, right? So, I mean, very much along the sides of what Michelle was talking about when she was talking about uh, reproductive politics. The politics of data infrastructure is also a politics of projecting certain visions of the future and of the organization of society um, forward. So, I mean, on one hand, I think, yes, I mean, it would be great <laughs> to think that um, something like um, the COVID pandemic would push towards uh, a situation where we pay more attention to the intersections between these infrastructures and also to their political weight. Um, what is what I'm seeing now is very um, is really not hopeful. I mean, and in fact, the example I was um, alluding to before, uh, like at the very end of my intervention on the G8 um, structure, is a, is an important one for me because a lot of my work is on open science, and this is a dispute where you see people who really believe in open science and putting up these amazing infrastructures that encompass everything. So you can find data about anything and everything. You can produce the most amazing science and represent everybody, right? <laughs> Trying to provide the argument with absolutely no awareness whatsoever of the incredible uh, amount of inequity and completely dysfunctional bias, discriminatory types of representation that are already present in the infrastructures that they are using, right? So the argument for, you know, having a science which is fully open, having these all-encompassing infrastructures becomes yet another illusion of comprehensiveness and of representation in a situation where representation is really absent. So for me, it's a false start, um, if you see what I mean. And it, you know, I mean, what we're hoping, of course, and what many people are working on is trying to avoid this false start and start from the realization of the incredible amount of inequity in this space, but that, that's, that's very difficult. So, so Boetica, I could say a couple of things that, yes. that combine both of these questions, if I may. Yes, please, right? go ahead. And this would, be, uh, this would be the sort of constitutionalism entry into this conversation, right? And a kind of question about what is the relation, question to Sabina and others about what's the relationship between data infrastructures and the data con digital constitutionalism, if you like. And it also speaks to uh, the distinction between constitutionalism and the constitution. So I just wanted to tell you a quick story. Um, so in America at the moment, we are enjoying very much um, the deplatforming of Donald Trump. Um, in spite of all of its complex um, issues that attend to it. Uh, shortly after the election at, at, the, at my university, we had an election teaching about sort of looking beyond the electoral moment. And there was a very interesting debate between the constitutional scholar, American constitutional scholar Aziz Rana and the science studies scholar Sheila Jasanoff. And basically Rana made a very powerful critique of constitutionalism as the response to the authoritarian threat. And that's what we're having, we're seeing in the US now, right? Is that there's this right-wing authoritarian threat and people are invoking the constitution and the rule of law as the response to it. And Rana pointed out that throughout American history, constitutionalism was actually used to sediment and institute entrenched power, including entrenched white power, right? racialized power. And what Jasanoff responded was that this is all very well, but it speaks to a legal tendency to think of the domains of constitutionalism as only operating within formal legal domains where the text has influence. And she said, one of the things that's happened in, in this country 
is that entirely absent a big C constitutionalism, there has been a radical rearrangement of social relations through science and technology, especially data. So there are a whole set of data practices that have enabled Americans to completely give up their privacy rights in all kinds of ways, even while there's a sort of formal legal invocation to privacy, right? And so even the kinds of basic um, sorts of data governance paradigms that one has in Europe are largely absent in the US and it's kind of a wild west. So there's been a very interesting emergent conversation around digital constitutionalism and what that would look like. But I think the provocation here is that what that would look like is a function of the political imaginaries that it comes out of. And I think that's what all of us is. So digital constitutionalism that comes out of Silicon Valley is going to look very different from a digital constitutionalism that comes out of people's health movements in the global south. Sorry, Michelle Thomas, would you like to come in right now? Uh, yeah, I was thinking about the, the this last point that uh, Kashik was making that the, you know we have to somehow understand the social and political historical context within which each of these uh, debates will be playing out. Uh, so, for example, um, you know th there's an interesting history of the development of urban racial segregation in South Africa emerging out of the 1901 bubonic plague as it arrived in Cape Town, setting up, uh, uh, so articulating with an already existing kind of racial logic, but for the first time really being deployed uh, in, a, in the, within the terms of public health to set up a, an urban spatial imaginary. So, uh, you know, if you fast forward, uh, yeah, roughly a hundred years, just over a hundred years, uh, the South African government as I mentioned earlier, inheriting a, a, a system of a population registration, so working with biometric data very much in, within a kind of digitalized imaginary, uh, but then outsourcing that, um, that database to a financial services company, NetOne, uh, which then through its subsidiary, Seek Cash Paymaster Services, is, is selling financial services to grant recipients at the same time as delivering grant payments. So, so you know how that's possible obviously uh, it depends on this arrangement of of technologies and particular kind of global financial set of possibilities but it also speaks to the very particular social and political context of south africa so you know the the appeal to constitutionalism i guess the question i would ask kaushik is is how one by what means one might imagine that such an ethic or, or, or horizon of possibility might travel uh, by what means is one going to thicken such appeals, given that we have, on one hand, very distinct histories, but also very connected histories. Uh, um, so, so we know that the particular technologies developed in South Africa were exported to Europe and, you know, and traveled safe between India and South Africa and, and Europe historically. We see that happening again in very uh, uh, terrible ways. Um, for example, in the kind of population registration efforts that I understand has um, been unfolding in India. Um, the, 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 so, so, in a sense, you know, I, I mean, that's why I appreciate Sabina's work that, you know, on showing us that we, we don't yet have, as I understand Sabina, so one, of, one of the questions you're asking is how do we thicken um, a, a somewhat situated understanding of these technologies and the way in which we are interpolated in and through these technologies in ways that um, in fact are already taken up in political systems. So in a sense the politics has way outrun the legal as I understand some of it, but 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 uh, how then to to come back on that? I guess I've sort of I want I want Kaushik to pose this question to Sabina in more first forceful terms. Uh, I, I, can I just introduce my uh, colleague Avadhinder's question here? I think that will go together very interesting ways. He's asking about the scale of this data and also its public nature. You know, he's, he's asking data, it seems, is both individualized and is about national population. Similarly, one is simultaneously invited to adopt individual hygienic practices as also negotiate national slash international boundaries. Is the COVID crisis then a rather 
distinctive moment combining public and private such that public health must necessarily attend to the private too. If this is something which you'd like to respond to in addition to what Thomas and Kaushik just said, I think they do address a similar or, or kind of you know related set of issues. Data, its publicness, relationship between this public data and private hygiene and private life, and also the how this this responds to larger democratic politics and particularly the way Kaushik is posing the question of constitutionalism. Would you like to respond? Anybody? I'll I'll jump in here. Um, please, I think please, that um, I think one way to think through the, the set of concerns is is with the trial population. And um, you know, Kaushik has also done done work on this in the Indian context um, because it it puts it, it gives us a situation in which we have uh, someone who is both a citizen, also a research participant, and in some cases also a patient. So there's quite a lot of different intersections going on there. Um, and I think, you know, kind of putting all of these questions together and coming back to this question of the biometric and the genomic, what we're seeing in, um, in the, the Southern African context is that research participants who are uh, involved in biobanking and offering their genomic data uh, are themselves offering up the language of reciprocity and solidarity as, as a means of, of understanding this exchange of genomic data uh, um, for research. Um, and I'm, I'm not as familiar with, with, uh, with what's happening elsewhere, if, if whether that language is, is explicitly used in that way. Um, so in Southern Africa, we have the concept of Ubuntu, which is I am because you are, which is very much a language that these research participants are used to describe their um, engagement. Um, so I'm not sure if that helps uh, throw an additional um, um, spin on, on what, um, what we've discussed so far, if anyone wants to, to follow on from that. Would anyone else like to jump in? Perhaps, I mean, just one consideration, I'm just wondering what the others think, is to which extent have we ever been able, certainly in the last maybe 150 years um, of uh, public health, generally speaking, to make a distinction between the individual and the population level um, in these ways. I mean, it seems to me that one of the things that now has come into the fore because of the kind of technologies we have, and, and basically what I would say is, you know, probably the disappearance of the notion of anonymization. I mean, that's just becoming obsolete. Um, because with the kind of data linkage um, technologies we have now, they, it's just an illusion, the idea that you can give data to a population level study and have that data stay anonymous, um, I think is basically gone. So I think because of this, uh, the, the dimension of the personal, even more than the dimension of the individual, I think is becoming something that um, is much more fragile and much more vulnerable that is maybe ever been, at least in the last you know, 150 years or so, or the history of, of, of thinking about um, health-related data in, in a broad sense. And I'm just wondering whether others think that that's um, a, a, you know, a way to characterize um, this situation. And that, I mean, that would put a spin to this question around what does the COVID crisis actually really prompt here. Um, I'm not sure about this combination of the public and the private, because I think that's really been there, it's basically been constitutive of, of how we do public health um, in a variety of ways. But this rise of the, um, uh, the personal, like, you know, in, in the sense, I guess, like what, what this, um, the person who's asking is, is probably interpreting the private, right? Like what uh, you associate to yourself in a kind of intimate sense. Um, that um, seems to be coming to the fore. I don't think necessarily relating to COVID, but just generally because of um, the technologies we're exposed to uh, at this point in time and the kinds of governance that, that they intersect. And yeah, I'm wondering whether people have um, reflections on, on the significance of this. Koshik, I have one more question from Avadhindra specifically for you. I think this will also allow us to take this uh, discussion further. Uh, uh, Avadhindra is asking what parallels, if any, may be seen between South African constitutionalism and the particular ways in which Article 21 had been used in the Indian case. And Koshik, if I may add my uh, question as well. You know, we are discussing this question of data on the one hand and this question of democracy uh, 
in both cases it seems to me there is a very central fundamental uh, uh, emphasis on numbers on 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 uh, the the quantitative quality but at the same time it looks like increasingly and probably covid is simply highlighting it you know amplifying it that these two different conceptualizations or imaginations of numbers or quantitative uh, qualities they are clashing with each other almost you know in in opposition to each other does that give you any any further edge to think about what comes next or something like this um well why don't i begin by answering avadendra's question specifically because it's a specific question and then and then open out to in some insufficient way um speak to to thomas's provocations and sabina's and and yours and the public private question right um so the first is that you know i mean the the very specific question of the relationship between south african jurisprudence around health and indian jurisprudence which largely as as many of you know revolves around article 21 right to life is that the south african constitution guarantees a fundamental right to health whereas in the indian constitution the right to health has to be interpreted right and there are many resources from which it can be interpreted the directive principles but but one resource from which it has been consistently interpreted is article 21 the right to life now i think simply speaking what that means is that there's a comparative judicial hermeneutics here right as to how the constitution comes to be interpreted by the higher courts ends up being quite different and um the south african constitutional court quite self consciously does not see itself as an activist court right um and so it sees itself as um in some ways as a as a cautious implementer of a transformative constitution whereas the indian court especially post emergency until recently i suppose has quite explicitly been an activist court right and is quite explicitly through the mechanism of the public interest litigation through the mechanism of a whole series of things has uh, has proliferated its interpretive capabilities in ways that are both extremely creative and extremely absurd right and so um and so there is a certain critique from within south africa that points to the indian courts in a more salutary fashion and says you know there is greater transformative potential here because you actually are seeing more radical interpretations of constitutional principles than are generally allowed in south africa but you also have article 21 being used just for everything right from censorship to all sorts of things everything becomes an infringement on right to life um one of my students shoyant and sahar roy has been working on this so this this leads to a very interesting you know sort of differential political culture but i think it speaks the more general point that this question speaks to again is the question of the interrelationship between institutions such as the courts or public health institutions and those who are able to constitute themselves as a civil society in order to get heard by either right in order to shape either judicial or public health cultures in particular ways rather than others and so just quickly in the public private distinctions a very interesting question that i don't fully know how to answer yet i think the third critical term certainly if one is thinking of both indian and south african histories is community right and there's a very vibrant history of community driven public health initiatives that that i know uh, michelle and thomas you can speak to out of the south african context that often engages in a very like as as is the case in india out of people's health and people's science movements that engages in a very lively critique of a sort of top down public health that has been instituted very strongly certainly in india at around the same time of economic liberalization and especially the 2004 congress government right so i think there's you know the the question of the place of 
community-driven health in this is an important one. And in India, you know, I mean, this is something that, that others in the audience can speak to better than me. The question of what that means when community health is under authoritarian attack in unprecedented ways, I think is also something to, or anti-democratic attack, shall we say, is also something to think. Michelle, Thomas, Sabina, do you want to come in or? Uh, I don't see any more questions. If you have any other questions, any of the uh, attendees, please uh, send it through the Q&A. Meanwhile, if any one of you want to intervene, please go ahead. Yeah, I was thinking, I mean, we've been speaking about India and South Africa in, 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 uh, in in quite detail now, but what if we were to draw in the UK and Europe as other polls in the as a, as a third poll, as it were, or even a fourth poll, uh, in response to this debate about constitutionalism and how it articulates with the governance of health and the governance of data? Because uh, again, it's this you know in the comparative move, there is a tension here for how to how to situate particular histories, for example, of say the invocation of community, which as, as we know is, is so labile, it's very ambivalent, it expresses very differently in different times. Um, uh, but but we, we sort of, at least in, our, in some ways, we, we have an inheritance here of a colonial set of vocabularies and institutions, which uh, the, you know, the past is not past in, in too many important ways. Um, you know, at the moment, at least in the UK press, it's it's amazing to see the the absolute commitment to the language of the South African variant. You know that 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 is a is is, is part of. It's hard for me to read that as separate from a very UK politics of its place in the world of of, of the Brexit conversation, uh, and also you know in the con. I mean, it's a bit of a stretch, but it kind of, there is a kind of broader crisis in the UK around, um, you know, it's, it's legal future in relation to um, the union and, and, and how to think about constitutionalism. So these, you know, I feel like these broader, there are broader processes here that, that express and ground themselves in very key moments. Uh, uh, for example, Lord Sumption's recent wreath lectures, for example, thinking through questions of law and life and health. You know, these are debates which are alive very much so in these in, in across these four contexts um, and yet uh, the difficulty is how do we raise a very situated specific kind of experience or insight to the level of a of a general or global kind of possibility or politics does it matter what happens in south africa for the eu does it matter in india what happens in the US and vice versa? How, or at least how do these things come to matter? Because it seems like there, are, you know, we might sit here and identify a range of structural kinds of processes um, and historical linkages, but it's not clear yet that these. What 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 does what does this mean for both our analytics, but then also for more public kinds of uh, forms that we might imagine? I don't know if that's too too wild a, a set of questions. I suppose in that sense, if I may say, the fact that three of us are based in the UK at the moment, despite coming from other places and bringing different baggages, is very significant because uh, the UK at the moment is engaged in a rather uh, peculiar type of politics of trying to forget that the rest of the world exists. This is absolutely intentional. It is very specific. And it's, um, you know, it's itself exceptionalist <laughs> in the sense that I don't see that applied in quite the same way pretty much anywhere uh, at the moment. So I think there's also a very specific set of sensibilities I think we have developed based in this island, uh, you know, which, which is now really thinking of itself as a planet of its own, um, which, are, which are interested in this situation, especially because um, the UK has long been associated with, uh, you know, an history of um, democratic representation and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, for those of us who live here, we're looking at 40% of children in England living well under the um, poverty line. And, you know, most people that we know having to use food banks, et cetera, et cetera, the national health system being dismantled uh, by the Tory government in a very authoritarian way 
this week. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting question how then discourses around colonialism and power get framed when the reality of the ground in, in a country like the UK at the moment is this, right? I mean, that certainly is something that is shaking, I think, relations. I don't know what, what you think about that. We have one more interesting question, which will speak partly to this. This is from uh, one of the attendees. I can't see the name. She's asking anyone can answer this, but the question of solidarity. This is, I think, one of the central issues that all of you uh, addressed at some point or the other in your presentation. Solidarity across the presentations was interesting, especially in the context of increasingly personal data being mined and surveilled. Apart from the people's movements in India, it would be great to know about other aspects and manifestations of solidarity. So if you could you know, reflect on something, one part of, of course, is this, this data surveillance, data mining, personal data. But how about this question of solidarity and often across locations? Um, I might say a few, a few words about that. Um, I think that in the South African context, it was it was really heartening to see the, the the kind of on the ground solidarity that happened in the first lockdown. So you know, people uh, ensuring that food would be distributed uh, to people in need, for example. So that kind of really um, local community forms of of social mobilisation definitely happened in South Africa in the first lockdown. Um, but as Thomas and Kasha have also spoken to, there's a very extensive history in South Africa rooted in, 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 in the anti-apartheid struggle that has, has really shaped responses to other um, social crises um, in, the, in the democratic era. Um, and I think the mobiliz mobilization around the crisis uh, that COVID has precipitated, which is both a, a crisis of health, but also a huge socioeconomic crisis, takes on those forms again. So the massive forms of mobilization from civil society. Um, I mean, I think the other important point that, that Sabina raised, which um, we haven't kind of come back to, is that um, between scientific networks globally, there were in fact were forms of solidarity of a kind in that there was this commitment to sharing data, which, which now is, is, is you know, being contested. So I'm quite interested in, in this question. I think when we wrote the India Forum piece, we, we, were, we were very interested in the idea of what would solidarity look like in this moment? What does, what does it mean? How do we um, think about it? Um, but I think what some of our, our work is pointing to now and thinking about are the, the side effects of, <laughs> of solidarity in a way of, of the, uh, the, uh, the other manifestations of um, these movements. Thanks, Michelle. Just a uh, point that uh, the question came from Vasudha. I couldn't see the name initially. Any, anyone else? Kaushik, Thomas? I, I, I could say a couple of, of things. So, Go ahead. so maybe there are three things that, that I'd like to say here, right? Which is, um, the first is simply kind of autobiographical, right? Which is that I think that one of the reasons why all of us are interested in this question of solidarity, also very much in quotes and under erasure, because solidarity is also a term that's appropriated problematically and so on. But one of the reasons that we are interested in it and also interested in this sort of comparative learning is because of our own diasporic itineraries, right? And so there's a way in which, you know, kind of encountering configurations in different contexts is inescapable for anyone who has such such an itinerary and um, you know i think i think i have interlocutors and comrades in um, in both india and south africa and in different ways in the us right but but how those how those relationships map becomes different and so for me in a very particular way the question of solidarity in my everyday academic life in the American university and sort of entering into American science policy debates is to relentlessly um, and often quite rudely um, 
push back against American parochialism and always fail to make a dent, right? Like everyone's polite, but then America continues going on being just as parochial as it was before. And, and so there is in the American geopolitical imaginary, and I think it extends across the political spectrum and across domains, the sort of now acknowledgement that the rest of the world exists, especially when it comes to public health, but often as um, the place to be saved. Right, you know, there's still this imaginary of America as the font of technological innovation and Africa as the place of lack. So the question of equity is how do we, you know, how do we get our technologies to Africa? And how do we, which very quickly becomes how do we open markets, right? And especially in the face of America's catastrophic response to COVID, you know, the fact, you know, there's at least a little bit of shamefacedness about that kind of imaginary, but there isn't another one that has replaced it, right? Even in science policy conversations, equity, yes, but learning from the global south, you know, that like if one speaks of that, it's as if one is speaking Sanskrit. So, uh, so part of the question of solidarity is how does one push back against the parochialism of American exceptionalism, and that's a difficult question to ask in the context, Thomas, of your presentation, because of course we're speaking of uh, of other locales, the UK, South Africa, and India, that are all extremely exceptionalist, and in some cases becoming more um, aggressively so, with day by day. Right? I mean, Pakistan's COVID response, by all accounts, was one of the best in the world, but um, I, I'm not sure there's much learning happening from that. Right? So. Uh, so that's 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 one thing, but the other thing that that um, that I wanted to point to was that uh, when we think of the question of relation, it's not just a question of transnational solidarity, but the question also of transdomain, right? And one of the things that that I'm finding in sort of sitting in some rooms with lawyers and some rooms with scientists is that you have an enormous amount of technocratic positivism on the one hand and an enormous amount of legal positivism in the other, especially in American legal cultures, which tend to be quite positivist, right? I don't think they are in the same way in, in India and, and, and South Africa. So how one thinks of a sensibility of, of co-production, what Sheila Jasen of calls co-production across different domains, you know, the, the scientific and the political, broadly speaking, as, as we think through imaginaries for the future um, is, is also pertinent to this question of solidarity. I wonder if I could just quickly add on to that because um, I mean, I fully agree with you, Kashi, but th there's something about the uh, the slipperiness of the social that slips back in to these invocations. And I'm thinking specifically about um, uh, both activists and lawyers and scientists, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking here from, from my research in Prozid and Natal, who will want to say something about the social and end up reproducing terrible stereotypes about communities, tribes, ethnicities, races, etc. Uh, and this, one sees this happening across the world in all sorts of difficult ways because, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a political and a conceptual difficulty when, when, when people find common cause, the material on, with which people will find common cause around are the very terms that we uh, are oftentimes very uncomfortable with. You know, to identify oneself as a member of a certain kind of polity comes with these complex forms of, of recognition and exclusion. And so, um, I, I mean, so, so there's a real difficulty with, with invoking solidarity all over the place, exactly as we've been doing this last year. I mean, it's, it's, it's very uncomfortable. But at the same time, I, I feel like we, 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 we need to we need to clarify and push each other on what exactly we mean by solidarity. Right now, the crisis is around vaccine access. Uh, 
And uh, certainly South African civil society activists had to put a huge amount of pressure on the South African government a few weeks ago to force them to come up with a, a vaccine, vaccination plan. It turned out they hadn't quite organized. But so, no, so immediately, of course, there were many South Africans who said, well, of course, illegal immigrants shouldn't get access to a vaccine before South African citizens. Uh, you know, so, so, and this kind of vaccine nationalism you see play out, of course, at the global scale. But there is a certain tradition within, uh, um, I, don't want to, I don't want to name it simply as the anti-apartheid movement, but, but, but more broadly, a, 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 a decolonizing kind of history of, of, of activism, which reaches for more, uh, with, uh, um, well, I'm quite sure how to put it, a, a kind of thicker, thicker form of, of uh, political community in ways that takes, uh, that really recognizes the, the immediate political challenges so I grew up in Zimbabwe at a time when Zimbabwe was a frontline state uh, facing the apartheid regime across the border. And so an invocation of solidarity in that moment was about a pan-Africanism uh, and, and, uh, and that had a very particular tradition. And so in the post-apartheid era, those invocations of solidarity have thinned out and fallen down in, in all sorts of ways, but it's very much reaching for a kind of uh, a an ethic and a politics that, um, you know, in some moments, for example, expresses as a kind of uh, um, politics of Africa in some contexts, or a politics of blackness, uh, a politics of redress, uh, and in some, in, 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 and there are moments when they elicit a kind of, a certain kind of progressive possibility, and then there are moments when they when they elicit a, a negative regressive possibility. And so the, the trick, I feel is how do we understand that and recognize that and yet offer each other uh, another kind of grounds on which to think differently. And, and right now, you know, South Africa is looking to India and the Serum Institute for another kinds of solidarity of which we, you know, we, 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 we're waiting in a sense. <laughs> And just to say that actually the same exact dynamics are playing out now with the whole idea of the European Union, even before we get into the, its manifestations and its institutional structures. So that same ambivalence, both in the politics on the ground, but also what it stands for and the different things that it stands for, is very much there. I mean, in, in my own perception of these kinds of things, um, you know, as much as, of course, these ambivalences are all there and there is a big question as to how one pushes them in the right direction or in a direction that you're comfortable with and, and, and reflects your values. Um, even just the existence of this kind of discourse in a longer term is very precious. Uh, because, for instance, when I look around the situation in Europe now, I don't see this discourse almost at all in the UK. I just don't see it at all. There is no political representation of any type that points in this direction. It's not labor, it's not any political party, there's really no institution which is part of the government that does any work of this type that I can see. And the few ones that were there have been dismantled or kind of, um, you know, defunded in the last uh, few years. While looking over to the continent, uh, the very idea that there is, you know, a set of institutions that are trying to, you know, explore what solidarity may mean at the international and transnational level is really very important. Thank you all. Uh, I think we'll have to bring it to a close. We are reaching almost 11 uh, here. I think this question of solidarity is a good point to end this discussion on. It's a complex question, but it's also full of ambivalent promises. And thanks a lot for your solidarity that you have shown today. We have been discussing this event for some time, but finally it has happened. And thanks a lot. Thank you so much for all your very interesting and very valuable contributions. Thank you. Thank Thanks you so much for hosting us. Thanks really wonderful. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.